George, fantastic to see you. How are you? I'm really well, thank you. How are you? Do you know what? I'm I'm good. I'm good. I'm I'm all the better for uh, for watching your new movie, Femme, uh, which I just saw yesterday. Uh, what a movie! Congratulations, first of all. No, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, I really did. Um, I, I don't know whether I never know whether to ask you, you to do this or I, I should do this, but I'm going to ask you to give us a brief overview of what Femme is about and, and the catalyst, I guess, which is the most important thing that starts the story of these characters going. Okay, so I guess firstly, the film is about drag and the way that we sort of can build and create identities beyond ourselves and then but the the sort of the sto- the the catalyst for the story is basically you begin the film with Jules who is played by Nathan Stewart Jarrett who is a drag artist at the kind of height of his powers um and at the beginning of the film there's an altercation with um this character Preston who I play in which there's a terrible homophobic attack where um they uh, they sort of attack Jules because of what he's he's in his drag outfit in this shop uh, and then the film jumps a few months later where Jules is still piecing himself back together from that attack. And he goes for the first time to somewhere he feels safe to a gay sauna where he sees the guy I played, Preston, and realizes, oh, this is where all of that kind of hate and animosity is kind of bundled up from. And not recognizing Jules in drag, uh, out of drag, sorry, we then pick each other up and Jules begins a relationship with Preston so to exact his revenge. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, that's a great a great brief synopsis. Thank you for that, George. That's that's what I read. Um, when I read a little bit about it, I was like, right, okay. And you've taken me to the point where I was like, I think I know what's going to happen. And the word, oh. the word that I think should be used to describe this film is surprising. Um, you oh, are taken places that you don't expect to be taken. It constantly pulls the rug from under you. Um. Tell me about your initial reaction when you first read this script by Sam Freeman and Unjun King, because I imagine it's the kind of script that you remember exactly where you were when you read it. Yeah, exactly. I was actually I was actually on a train when I when I when I read it, and I was absolutely blown away. Like I was, I was sort of I was kind of bowled over, slightly intimidated, and then massively thrilled. Um, as a piece of writing it is so taut it's so beautifully put together and as you say it's kind of as a reader for the first time you kind of like okay i think i've got this i think i get the sort of the angle that they're pushing and then it kind of goes another level and another level and it unfolds and twists and turns um and, and what it looks at it's kind of looks at everything sort of so fairly and in it's quite a sort of compromising read as well because you see yourself in kind of both characters as to like okay this is when i presented a certain part of myself and this is the power in that this is the danger of that um and uh and but then as then sort of thinking about it as an actor it was like thrilling because because it's such a meaty role both Jules and preston they're kind of like they're multiple characters within themselves um, because they have sort of created personas based on a certain element of them. So to hide another element of them and then enter into a relationship where they're then playing other versions of those things in order to sort of try and cat and mouse with each other. So it's, um, it was a very exciting to read it. I mean, you use the word thrilling there. Now, obviously at the start, as you described it, it, it begins with this awful homophobic attack. But I do think it is important to say that this isn't a grim British drama. Not that there's anything wrong with those. Yeah. This is a thrilling neo-noir that just basically removes the kind of, I guess, hyper-masculine men you normally see inhabit that genre and yeah. replaces them with characters that you rarely see in this kind of film. Yeah, that's. I mean, you, well, you've said it beautifully in terms of that's what that's what Sam and Ping wanted to do there massive fact like so sam um this is the first feature film that they've directed sam was a screenwriter or is a screenwriter and ping is a director in theater and they came together with this idea as fans of that genre of the kind of neo-noir thriller i I mean sort of those 70s kind of amazing films like you know like goodfellas taxi driver um and then sort of more recently good times was a real touchstone for them as well by the safety brothers but they're often these kind of hyper macho fast-paced um kind of thrill rides and they wanted to put a queer character at the center of that because as queer filmmakers themselves never sort of felt like felt that their voice were 
was kind of represented in that story. So they did this short film with Papa Sedu and Harris Dickinson playing kind of equivalent versions of the Jules and Preston that, that Nathan and I play. Um, and that sort of garnered some success and kind of led to the feature film. Um, and it's exactly that. It's it's very British and Indian in a lot of ways, but the touchstones are actually that kind of like frenetic adrenaline pumping American neo-noir. So it's um it's a beautiful kind of cross pollination of a few things. And as I started, um, I started telling you at the start, and then I was like, no, 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 we'll save it for air, save it for air. It is, it's a movie that I've been thinking about for the last twenty four hours. I saw it about twenty four hours ago, and it just. It really asks questions of the audience. You, you, you are left questioning, I guess, your own sense of morality in terms of what justice is acceptable and, and the sympathy you feel from where you expected to feel the sympathy at the start is, uh, is a 180. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think that's, that's, that's the thing is it's, it's kind of, it's beautifully, it's not, it's not a sort of binary film where it's like this person's wrong, this person's right. It kind of, because of the, what it unpacks and unfolds and the things you learn about them. And because also wonderfully the characters that sort of like Jules's characters, that's some pretty morally dubious stuff as well. Right. Um, yeah. So it's, <laughs> and, and also the thing that it treads this line, the whole film, there is a sort of very real physical, violent, mortal threat to it. But there's, is also what almost becomes bigger is this idea that you're, identity that you form the kind of um the persona that you carry the clothes that you wear the kind of um legend that you create for yourself in life is is almost more real and i think that speaks to nowadays as well it's almost more real than who you are in your flesh and bones so there's this kind of dual tension of like those things always being fought for or protected and potentially destroyed so yeah it does so i mean doing it it totally made me question okay what 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 am i putting on as a front what what is me sort of kind of harnessing a little bit and hiding something else um and also it, similarly the things which i thought it was kind of going to sub- subvert about looking at sort of that more toxic masculinity they also there's a there's a stage in the story where Jules actually starts to really harness that power positively, and you kind of totally don't don't expect that to come from from his character, given the sort of the the power powerful position that he comes from and what he's sort of trying to reclaim by going to that other side, if you know what I mean. So yeah, it's yeah, um, yeah. without giving too much away, it's totally it makes you ask questions as you go. Yeah, I think adverbatum he uses uh, Preston's own words against him, which is uh, mm. a nice touch. It's, I mean, in a very literal sense. Um, let's talk about Preston then, your character Preston, because I'm guessing here, I'm not an actor. Um, I'm guessing he is an appealing role for an actor to play. Growing up, watching movies, were there certain kinds of characters that you saw, maybe even specific characters, that really influenced the choices you're making now as an actor, including, for example, Preston. Yeah, I think, oh, that's as nice of you to ask, because I think Preston is totally within the vein of the characters that I've, and performances that I've revered growing up. I think I love, you know, nuanced, complex characters, which feels like a bit of a, you know, stock answer. But I mm-hmm. think I've also admired slightly operatic big performances as well like i i mean i mean i admire all and and sort of understand sort of as i got older you know subtlety is subtlety is is vital and um but there are performances like i remember john leguizamo in um in romeo and juliet and the sort of like matador kind of oh. kind of positions that he was pulling in that in that petrol petrol um, station gunfight like i mean heath ledger's the joker um gary oldman in true romance like People are Every taking Nicholas sort of slightly cage bizarre. performance ever. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, basically, and just, yeah, or interview as well. Um, <laughs> I, and uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, of course, like you know, Daniel Day Lewis. I remember being really struck seeing the trailer and then loving the film, but really struck seeing the trailer for um, the Master by Paul Thomas Anderson. And the, the very first trailer was a scene that wasn't actually in the final film, I don't think. And it's kind of like. Freddie Quell, Joaquin Phoenix's character, almost kind of getting some sort of psych test with the guy from the army. And he's got this kind of, he's pulling this almost like Popeye-esque face. And it's so dangerous and delicate and nuanced, but also kind of massive as well. And those things, I remember being like, wow, that's acting. Because also like humans, like we're all massive. Like you, you, you pick anyone on the street and you that's that's a very strong walk that that person's got. Or 
this person's speech pattern or their gestures were all so different. Um, but I think there's almost sometimes I've learned working that often you kind of bring things to yourself where I think there's a real amazingness to use a non-word in, in sort of going beyond yourself as well and kind of going bigger than life. Um, which Preston, because of the conundrum of who he is, has has become that. As, as, as I say, the film's about drag and, and drag is sort of, I guess, taking an element of yourself and turning the volume up to 11. And in, in hiding certain aspects of himself, he's done that um, with this kind of hyper macho, hyper sort of fashionable persona um, that is a kind of, is both truthful and part of who he is and also totally a front. So to use the the word you use there, bigger in in its most literal sense, because I I think a, a lot of people will will know you from your lead role in Sam Mendes as uh, 1917, uh, and also Pride. It's fair to say you have transformed in this. So you're a lot bigger, and yeah. uh, I, I know you're not spoiling it right now, so it's not permanent. But I was yeah. watching it with a friend, and I turned to them, and I was like, it's amazing how much a neck tattoo can change your perception of a person. Talk us through this physical transformation into press. Yeah, well, well the, the physicality is like, is something that I think I, I'm really drawn to in, in roles as well, because there's something when you kind of, you know, you're adding layers with the costume and the, with the makeup, but if you sort of do it with your flesh and blood and sort of muscle and skin, you know, you go up or down or whatever, as long as it's relevant and done safely and all of that, like it, it feels, it roots you to the character and, and Preston is also rooted within this kind of idea of himself. And, and it is also just an aesthetic that is kind of recognizable for the type of man that he wanted to portray is he's wanting to be an alpha and needing to be an alpha and sort of the typical idea. And that, but also the, the film sort of works in subverting stereotypes. So he needed to be stereotypically alpha in a bunch of ways. So putting on as much sort of muscle as I could was a big part of it. The tattoos, Again, our wonderful um, makeup and hair designer, Marie Dean. It was always specified that Preston needed a, a neck tattoo as a sort of story device to make him recognizable to Jules in the way that when Jules is out of drag, I don't recognize him. So I kind of imagine something pretty subtle because I've not got any tattoos, you know, maybe something below the ear there. And then Marie sent these references of these huge collars. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I, don't know, I mean, we can try it. And then as soon as we did, we suddenly went, that's him. That's right. And like, well, then if he's got a neck tattoo, that can't be the only tattoo. So we need to do much more here and much more there. And we, you kind of then used it to build a map of like, I think he's someone who's not comfortable with who he is at his core. And so therefore is always kind of shifting his outer layers to match, you know, he's a bit of a fashion victim in a, in a sense. And so we kind of thought we could map the stages that he's gone through and like, he got this kind of tattoo and that kind of tattoo was cool. And he got that tattoo and that tattoo was cool. And and then also some almost like subliminal messaging about him in terms of the more feminine side that is also innate within him that, you know, does get teased out at certain points in the story and, and a gentleness. And we sort of try to like weave that nuance into the choices of certain tattoos and then also kind of show the armor of his persona in other tattoos. So, and all of that stuff really more so than 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 maybe any other job the the costume and makeup changed how i felt in myself massively and so was a huge part of the performance because also some of that's you almost don't have to work as hard as when you've got all those jewels and the tattoos and the haircut and the muscles you can talk in the exact same way that i do and you will receive it differently because of how i look you right. know it's sort of understand and the film is about two men who understand the power of those aesthetics mm -hmm. um so just doing that helped help me out massively. <laughs> and, and I'm asking as a, a man who's never had any musculature whatsoever. I've never been big. I've always been uh, either like thin or thin fat. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> what's it actually like, even out of character, putting on muscle? Does it actually change the way you feel? Like uh, apart from forgetting the, the gym side of it and the endorphins yeah. and the exercise and the health thing, being a slightly bigger build. Does yeah. it, do you feel different? It does to me. And maybe that sort of speaks to certain insecurities, which is why I understand <laughs> Preston. But it does. I think there's a kind of, you know, the film is all about nuance. And I think, you know, with every 
day that goes past, life gets more nuanced. And as I get older, I understand the sort of nuance of life a lot more. But it, then there is at the core of it, which is also what the film explores. There's a sort of animal thing of like, I'm the strongest. I'll beat you in a fight. Like, <laughs> I could win this. Like, if we went toe to toe physically, I would beat you. And that would sort of, that is a kind of like, it does speak to a sort of confidence of, to a certain part of you in certain contexts. And, you know, and I, we're not in that sort of day to day physical world, but that was also part of like the legitimate threat that Preston poses to Jules and within the story is I think it's, it's all, the film is also about the worlds that they come from. And I think that Preston, it was important to me that he was, he was rooted in a place where physically like there has been violence and that he has that kind of, um, what's that? What's that? What's kind of that switch or that kind of trigger where if he goes, he really will go. Um, and, and so, so yeah, so, so it does, it, it, it does, does to me, but maybe that's speak it again, like analyzing myself, speaking to an insecurity. That was something. Yeah, I, I think you've touched on my fear of ever getting too big. Cause I'd be like, this is great. I can finally win a fight. I must look for a fight. Uh, just to <laughs> yeah, test yeah, this new yeah, theory. I mean, wind up at like the end of breaking <laughs> ball, just banging a wall going, going yeah. what was it all for? I should have stopped that, you know, being comfortable and sitting yeah. here. Yeah, sitting here in my ergonomic chair interviewing you. This is much <laughs> more my speech. Uh, you, you, we mentioned uh, Nathan Stewart, Gerard. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I think he's wonderful. I thought he's, won he's done wonderful work for years. Um, how was it working with him in, in this very interesting dynamic? I think you called it earlier a game of chess. These two yeah. characters who, in these moments, are trying to figure each other out, trying to work out what their next move is. I mean, that requires, I, I'm imagining, without knowing, um, quite a, a, a good working relationship with your co-star. Yeah, I mean, working with Nathan was just an absolute dream. Like, Likewise, I've admired his work and, and seen him on stage and on screen. And um, he's a phenomenal actor and, and a really lovely, lovely man. Um, so it was a, it was a pleasure. And I, I think our thing was kind of, we didn't actually have a huge amount of time before we shot the film. We sort of, we had our chemistry read and then we had a week of rehearsals where we were there together. Um, a lot of which actually we were sort of, I was in, you know, putting all my tattoos on and trying things out and he was trying on his heels and his costume. So, um, yeah. like, but, but there was a sort of real pragmatism, I think, to how we worked, which might, might sound sort of surprising given the sort of intimacy and intensity of like, the relationship between two men on screen but like i say that in the sense of like we both knew we're gonna have to kind of pretty much on day one figuratively and literally get undressed so let's dive in together let's do it you know let's not let's let's not beat around the bush let's just go for it and i i want to do that for me and for you and i know that you want to do that for you and for me so it kind of created this really open loving sort of place basically um that was sort of just built upon that. We both just wanted to do a good job really and knew that to do a good job, we'd have to dive in, you know, you know, with, I was, I don't know the, the, the phrase, I was like feet first, head first, dive in completely with all the limbs. Yeah. Um, so, um, so yeah, it was, and then, but then as actors as well, it was a very supportive relationship because Sam and Ping, our directors, they always said that the edit was very important to them in crafting the chess match that we spoke of. And so some of the time within scenes, we'd play a few where it's like, okay, give me a take where you lean heavy, like Preston, you lean heavy on being really scary for this one. Let's let's have you be, give him, give Jules nothing, give nothing away and just try and scare him. Or, okay, now do one where you're really enjoying this and you're kind of starting to open up. And uh, and we would, and, and Nathan would get equivalent notes and, and we would sort of help each other with whatever version that Sam and Ping wanted to tease out of that scene. So it felt kind of very playful and kind of dexterous, the... Um, you know, the making of it. And um, it's a wonderful film. It hits UK cinemas on December the 1st. And I, I, I want to give you a compliment without giving too much away. I will say, I don't think this gives too much away. And if it does, it's going in the edit. But <laughs> the way people, I think, will end up feeling about your character at the end from where they felt about them at the start is a testament to your performance. It's incredible and it's unexpected and it's a really thrilling movie. So well done. Oh, cheers. Thank you very, very much. I mean, hey, no worries, man. Like I said, December the 1st, it hits UK cinemas on the subject of cinemas. It's now time, George, to leave this reality and <laughs> enter 
a dimension of pure film where our virtual cinema awaits. You are our guide. We are your audience. Let's go on a trip to the movies. So we push open the doors to our temple of film and find ourselves in the foyer. There's an excited buzz as there always is in a cinema foyer. The hum of anticipation. It's your perfect cinema trip, George. Who have you picked, living or dead, to go with you? Well, as I said, I was listening to an episode the other day and um, I believe it was Jay Blakes that said a similar thing where I find it the biggest luxury to go on my own. <laughs> so I was going to, I would, I would. Why, wait, some... why do you, why do you love going on your own? Tell me, because I do too. Can, why it's, do you love it? it's so like you can just completely submerge in it. And it's, it's just, a, I just, lo- I just love it. It was something that I was kind of, when I was younger, I almost felt a bit funny about like, who goes to the cinema on their own? And then I did it. And I was like, that was the best best day ever <laughs> like i'm gonna you know i used to i used to go for sort of morning double double headers as well like you know you go first screen and get a coffee grab a sandwich go in straight again yeah. on your own and you sort of then have seven hours to yourself to have your mind blown and taken off onto worlds and then go meet someone after to then go you know debrief on all the films that you've seen <laughs> um, but in light of it sort of potentially put in a you know hobbling the the rest of this this wonder of wondrous cinema cinema journey if I'm not going myself, it would of course be my partner. But then, outside of you know, in a more cinematic world, I would love um, to sit down with Leonardo DiCaprio in terms of plotting his career, like the choices that he's made, the, the films that he's worked on, the performances he's given, um, and the fact he's sort of he's done it in such a kind of classy way. He's such a kind of Goliath of quality, basically, um, in his work, in the work that he associates himself with. I would love to have some popcorn and just as the credits are rolling or before the adverts start, bend his ear on his life. (laughs) And, you know, and him and Scorsese and, you know, all the sort of many people he's worked with and the choices he's made. And so I I might um, might just casually take Leo for my magical (laughs) cinema trip. I mean... You've created a real issue, not for me, but for you here, because standing outside the cinema... Currently, a Leonardo DiCaprio and your partner. You can only take one. Who right, are you taking? I'll take my I'll take my partner then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're putting Leonardo DiCaprio back in a taxi. See you, Leo. You see you. Yeah, it's the <laughs> ultimate power boost there. You know, sorry, Leo. I'll get you next time. So, do you and your partner have a similar taste in films? Is it is it always is it always a good cinema trip? You're like, yes, we both want to see the same movie. It's kind of not not always, but I think I, I think I I take it just because it's um. You know, we actually sort of, it's few and far between the times where we get to go to the cinema together. And therefore it is genuinely, it's genuinely such a joy because I love the cinema. And if, if it's something we can do together, it's a kind of rarity. So given the magical nature of this particular foyer in cinema, I'd, um, yeah, I'd take her. So this is a, this is a, this is a rare treat taking your partner to this virtual cinema. I like that. I like yeah. the fact it's all red. If it wasn't special enough already, it's already a special event it's really interesting what you say about the other caprio i only read this the other day about titanic how he had to be convinced to do titanic by james cameron because up wow. until that point not to generalize but to generalize he played quite affected characters and he felt mm. jack was just a very straight heroic nice role and wow. james cameron had to explain that actually that in itself is more taxing to play and yeah. create on screen so a, a kind of a, a complete character who is just a nice guy than all these characters he played previously. That's so interesting because I, I, it wasn't that long ago I saw Titanic again and I was watching him going, he's so bloody good because that's really hard to do. You know, the amount of tapes over the years, you know, you're trying to, you know, basically play Jack Dawson where you're kind of, you get the role that's sort of like a good looking, nice, affable, slightly mm. kind of like a really nice, but also a bit of a rogue um, and that sort of, there was such kind of light in his eyes um, and such an energy about him. I can kind of totally get in hindsight because I was too young when, when it, when it came out, but like kind of go, oh, wow, that's how he sort of went. There's a, there is a magic to him where you go, there's, there's a special quality about him in that film with them both actually. But, you know, p- particularly with him, what he, you know, what he does is, as you say, it's difficult. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be, or at least some, some of the time, maybe someone have, have people have that so naturally in themselves and it sort of maybe ends ends there, but he's gone on to do such amazing work. Um, it's, uh, yeah, 
I'll, I'll bend his ear on that. I'll, I'll, I'll call him in the ta- in the cab and FaceTime about about that. <laughs> Do you know what? I, I feel bad now. I'm, I'm bringing him back. I've called him. He's coming back. I'm, I'm doing a rare thing, George. I'm letting wow, you have oh both your word. partner okay, okay. and Leonardo DiCaprio are joining you on this trip. So there's a clock on the wall in the foyer. Yeah. Read a specific time. What time have you, your partner, and Leonardo DiCaprio gone to the cinema? It reads 10.32 um, because I feel like that's about that's a reasonable hour to sort of get up, get on the tube, and go to the virtual cinema, cinema world. Um, and I, I love the first showing of the day, um, which you know, which I think sometimes is a bit later than that. But morning, I've got such good memories of going that kind of almost basically you you get up, you get some breakfast, you get on the tube, and you go into town and watch a film. You lean home. Um, so I'm going to say 10.30 because that feels like it's a, it's another, it, it's lovely treat day. You've had a wee bit of a lay-in, but but you're also kind of up and at them and, you know, sat in the cinema before before it's late. And so going in the morning screen around 10.30, is that purely a, a choice thing or is it part, does it that work better with your schedule? Is it almost a necessity that that is the best screening well, for you? I, I, no, I'm always, I'm a morning, I kind of prefer, I prefer early mornings than late nights personally. So so I, I'm kind of always quite happy to kind of go and, uh, you know, and, and again, there's something, it feels really sort of, there's something quite luxurious about, you know, so many folk are at work usually. And I, the only other version which I kind of thought about was like going to a packed cinema is very exciting. Like, you know, when a big blockbuster comes out and you go to like an eight o'clock screening and everyone's left work and had a drink and then gone to the cinema and you're in that buzz. But there is something I think I'd still stick to just being a morning person. I think I'm sort of almost start best and peter out as the day goes on. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna start at ten thirty at the cinema. We're going at ten thirty two. So which uh which because you've booked the tickets, which seats in the auditorium have you booked for us to sit in? Well, depending on I, I guess so to depending on the size of the screen, um I basically would go the middle of the aisle and then so it could kind of the ratio works with whatever size screen then if you go from the middle between the middle and the back row so you know whatever that is if there's if there's 20 20 rows in there row 17 um in the in the, but so yeah in the middle of the in between the middle and the back and then the center of that aisle so you don't need an aisle some people need an aisle you don't need an aisle seat you're happy in the middle of a row i'm i'm happy i think it's yeah i, I like to kind of yeah, I, I I don't like to see a film sort of t- from off to the side. If I can, I'll get to the middle as much as I can. Uh, you've picked one of the most popular seats on the show, so I'm giving you the middle of the middle with exactly <laughs> the right distance from that cinema right. screen. So the final thing we need before we leave the foyer and enter the corridor towards the auditorium, oh, the air is full of wonderful smell. Every manner of snack and food stuff is available. What are you choosing to eat? Well, for, I've got two answers. So if if I'm going, um, if there's a crowd of us, I'm going to go for salted popcorn and apple straws. Um, but oh, if nice. it's just if I've snuck in on my my own, maybe this again talking of like like femme building identities. I feel a slightly more cultured snack if I'd have some dark chocolate and a coffee. I think there's something very again luxurious about having a coffee in the cinema. Um, and so and as well, if I'm on my own, I don't like to be eaten too much. Like I kind of just like to strip it back to just the film but i also because you're at the cinema you want something so i'd i'd go for a wee a wee dark chocolate and a coffee um or otherwise if you know if leo was there i'd, I'd share a, a bag of popcorn salted popcorn and and apple straws from the pick and mix i totally get it uh one of life's little pleasures is dark chocolate with a cup of strong coffee. There's, yeah. I honestly, I so I think about it all the time. If I'm <laughs> ever like, what do I need to just cheer me up? Dark chocolate, hot, strong coffee. But that's the thing, and you don't need too much. They could just be both of them can be can be wee. And then, but that's the thing. And then you've kind of like almost some of the time they're satisfying. If because I love the adverts in films as well. I always need to be there for the trailers. Um, and uh, and sometimes it's quite satisfying if you just finishing it as the film's beginning, as you know, the, the titles of the kind of production companies are rolling and you just put down the coffee and like, right, I'm, I'm ready now. So that, that was, that would be perfect timing if I can manifest that. Lovely. Uh, but however, as it turns out, you have guests. So it's a salted popcorn and apple straws. And you take it with you. Um, yeah. Anything to drink? So, I know you have coffee. If you're on your own, you're in a social situation. Uh, do you want to? No, just, just, 
just a water with the salted popcorn. Um, yeah, just a water, nice and boring. Done. You've got Done. everything you need. It is time <laughs> to leave the foyer and walk down the corridor towards the auditorium. Now, the corridor is looking a little bare at the moment, so I'm going to put up some posters along the cinema wall to illustrate some of your most important movie memories. And the first poster mm. depicts, George, your fondest movie memory. You mean have the fondest movie memory, um, I would say, was, I would say, actually, you'd lean have, you'd lean have, be, um, you'd lean have, can I create like a weird sort of Barbie Heimer kind of split poster? Yeah, right now, you absolutely 100% can. That's very, very in vogue at the moment. I, I used to, I used to watch the Jungle Book every day as a wee boy, like every day. Um, so I would have, the Jungle Book animation, and then I was as I sort of the first DVD that I had was um, was Gladiator, um, and I never got to see that in the cinema. Um, but those battle sequences I used to watch on repeat as well. So I would sort of like smush, you know, the Gladiator book together, <laughs> sort of so like a, now like a weird version of the Notebook, like a sort of Roman romance or something. Um, but I would have the Jungle Book and the Gladiator there as my fondest, you know, cinema experience. Okay, okay, so Jungleator or Gladdy Book? Um, Jungleator, because that, that, you know, that feels like also like it kind of could be like a kind of cool, I feel like we could then create our own movie. It would be like a sort of kind of, you know, Squid Game-esque movie or something like <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh in fact in fact because i think i said it first i'm copywriting that i'm going to be pitching that that is a new show you're going to be seeing on your screens very soon Jungle Jungle it, it does feel like some of you know some of the decisions that they get made in terms of like well this has worked and this has worked let's put them together <laughs> so like, if we are seeing jungle later in a few a few times it's you know so it i'm imagining these with these were quite early cinematic experiences because going to the cinema um especially as a child, did you always feel like from the very first times you went, this is a, this is a special event. This is, this is something that uh, I want to keep happening throughout my life is going to this building. Yeah. I, I, um, I have so many memories, like a kind of general memory of that particular, of the hallway that we're walking down now, not, not just the sort of magical virtual hallway, but the, um, I've got like a multiplex hallway that that excitement like the point where you've just had your ticket handed in and you're finding out which screen to go to um and then, and so you know often your screen is like way down the end of the corridor and that carpet with the pattern in it the sort of muted sounds and the smells and and the posters going by and and people walking out and talking excitedly about one cinema um you know so I've got one one film that they've just seen like those genuinely those corridors like and also it feels like when you're a, when you're a kid you often get taken when the weather's bad as well so there's a kind of like warmth you've just come in your cheeks are still cold from outside your hair's maybe damp from the rain and but then you're in this sort of soft warm you know popcorn smelling womb of a place and with all these kind of lovely like dim lighting but then the posters shining you know and, and there's always oh i want to see that or i have seen that or that's coming out soon and you know, it's just full of excitement so yeah, that 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 corridor is is a very fond memory, and, and I remember I've got so many fond memories of that place, and it never gets old. To be honest, every time I go in whatever context, that kind of entrance to the cinema always feels special. So we're all, we're literally in your favourite place in the cinema, this corridor, as you can yeah. see, see the doors to the auditorium in the distance. I do get what you mean, and I guess the one thing I miss, and you do see them occasionally, not as much anymore, were like literal 3d creations like a character from a movie standing there in yeah. the foyer i remember yeah. going to see <laughs> i mean i wasn't going to see this movie because i was like five or six years old but i remember walking through the odeon foyer in leeds on the hedgerow and there was a queen alien statue there and i was wow. like i need to see that i don't want to see yeah. Tev as the movie i want to see that yeah, 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 yeah. I know exactly what you mean. Those cardboard sort of cutouts. I've, I seem to remember like the sort of the Toy Story kind of characters being in, in the multiplex near me growing up as well as like probably Toy Story 3 came out or something when it was sort of established parts of your childhood. Um, but yeah, they're always, always great. I once, um, I once where I hosted a Disney premiere and I was working with a guy in a woody suit and mm. um, I was standing with uh, the, the representatives 
from Disney. And I, I, we were talking through how it was going to work. And I was like, so, um, so yeah, so, uh, so this guy played Woody. And they went, whoa, 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 whoa. Never say that. This is Woody. Just call him Woody for the whole time. Can you imagine if a child heard you say this guy played Woody? I'm like, yeah, but it's just us. They're like, doesn't matter. This is Woody, full stop. I was like, yeah. Like, yeah. A slip of the tongue could could destroy it, you know. <laughs> like, right? yeah, any sort of perception of that character. <laughs> All right, let's continue down the corridor. The second poster we're putting up depicts your worst movie memory. I have never. I feel slightly bad about this because I know how much goes into a, a film. And actually, I've since seen the stage show, heard a really great night, but I really didn't get on with Mamma Mia when I watched. It's the one film I nearly walked out of. Um, I don't know why. I think maybe I had like a just be in my bonnet, but I went with some friends and was a bit like, oh, I'm just not, I'm just, I'm just not getting it. I'm just not getting it. <laughs> and and it didn't, I just didn't get it that night. And so that's the one time that I've considered, you know. And it wasn't like it, it wasn't sort of particularly acrimonious, but it was just that thing of like, should we, should we head? And I've never had that. I've never, never had that. And I feel terrible because, you know, I would never. I almost feel like you know that's sacrilege to say that about a movie you know in general and that was made by some great people and um you know and it is a great show but for some reason that that's the one memory i have of being okay with leaving a cinema which we which i didn't leave but mm. i've never ever felt that otherwise i'd always kind of that's the other thing about the focus of a cinema is even if you're kind of like okay this is which is something i don't think we have as much nowadays when we watch more at home where like you know, you, you're sort of like, okay, well, maybe we should we just finish it tomorrow or something? We You can't because you've committed to the ticket. Um, so I'm, I'm now feeling terrible guilt for Mamma Mia, which I'm sure is a you know, perfectly great film. Um, I'm feeling really genuinely guilty now, but that was the one time I sort of nearly went, shall we? Um, but you, you didn't, but you stayed till the end. <laughs> yeah. That counts. That counts for that something. Counts. You stayed till the end. Yeah, I'm 2008. Abba has some absolute bangers as well. Like, you know, there's one of those bands where you're like, that's Abba too? Oh my word. So, um, yeah, all the love to Abba. I was dragged uh, to see Abba Voyage, you know, the hologram show that they have over in East oh, London. Wow. How, was that? How was that? I had exactly the same experience you're describing. I was like, this is Abba? This is great. I love yeah. this. <laughs> By the end, I was on my feet going, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, I don't think you need to feel too bad about uh, Mamma Mia. It's still the biggest selling DVD in UK history. So it did all right. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Then. You know, maybe I'll get it then and, and see, you know, have a second watch now. It's just maybe it's just the time. <laughs> the only person I felt sorry for who got, who got quite a drubbing in the press from the critics was Pierce Brosnan for his singing. And I just, I feel bad for him because he did interviews and he said, look, singing as an actor makes me feel very vulnerable. Um, but even though I know I'm not a great singer, I know people found it entertaining, which I think is true. Obviously, you've um, appeared in a previous guest on this show's wonderful Proclaimers uh, musical, Sunshine on Lee, uh, Dexter Fletcher, who's a, a great director. How was that for you, obviously, singing the Proclaimers in that? Well, <laughs> yeah, again, I'm, I'm hitting myself with a guilt stick now. Like, yeah, because I get it. It's singing's hard. Like, I remember with, you know, wonderful Dexter, like the the day of the read through um turning up and he was like right there's roddy you'll be doing this you know the um the playing guitar for the so for the songs and i was like what well, well, sorry we're singing today and he was like well yeah it's, it's a musical <laughs> i was like i didn't think we'd sing on the read through like oh my god like you know it's terrified so but the beautiful thing about it is like like anything and again you know sort of looping it to feminine ways when you when you've got to do stuff that you're a bit nervous about um and you do it and it's grand it's the most wonderful feeling afterwards because you're like, wow, we did that. And I, I want to do it again now. So, um, yeah, all the, you know, but I, I understand I've done some, some, yeah, a few, a few kind of musical films and, and the singing is always a joy, but at first terrifying. And um, you mentioned at the start about the, some of the scenes you share with um, Nathan Stewart Jarrett as Jules and your character Preston in the movie being very intense. Were you able to break character sort of, you know, quite soon afterwards or even if something was going wrong and just sort of have a laugh about the moment or did that ruin what you were trying to create? No, I think it genuinely changed every every day. I think it's one of those ones where actually given the intensity of this, this the story and the happenings, it was a very joyous set. Like, and everyone kind of almost needed to maybe have a bit of levity and a bit of light in between. 
Um, and but that said, then there, there were other scenes where you know, um, if if it had to, if you had to be in a certain zone, I think kind of Nathan and I intuitively was like, okay, no, we're both going to sort of stay in it a wee bit for this one. Um, and even that that was the joy of working with him is that some scenes, as soon as you know they could cut, a joke would be shared because you can almost tell like, okay, we need to we need to kind of keep the ball in the air here and kind of get back to us for a second. And then other scenes, you know, and it might be an intense scene, it might not be where suddenly you'd be waiting to go and suddenly you just say something in character and you realise you'd quietly be improvising between the two of you to kind of get, so you were kind of getting up to a, a trot before you galloped into the scene, if you know what I mean. I do. That's cool. That's cool. I mean, I I just wonder, you know, as not an actor, when you watch scenes like that, you're like, do they then sort of just everyone sort of go, okay, silence, or are you able to go, cool, glad we did that, that's good, it's, done it. Yeah, it's it's a mixture. It's always the kind of the big glad we did that as usually comes at the end of the day, but but no, it was it was a it was a, like the, the energy on set was really wonderful with them. It was a very young crew as well. Like everyone was, and and everyone was just sort of so enthusiastic about what we were making. So I, there was a real kind of vibe and kind of commitment with everyone the whole time. Okay, well, let's continue down the corridor, George. The third poster I'm going to pick up, uh, put up rather. Well, I'll pick it up and then put it up. It's the last <laughs> performance that brought you to tears. Um, this one, uh, it's funny, I haven't actually cried for a long time at, at the cinema. Um, and I'm always moved when I, when I go. The one thing that nearly made me cry in terms of it was sort of stuck with me, which again, this is maybe one half of the, the Schmush poster is past lives I saw recently. And I thought that sort of the, the beauty and the kind of understanding and the sensitivity of that film and what it's exploring and how it articulated itself was so beautiful um that really struck me i didn't sort of tears weren't streaming but that's nothing against you know the film i was really sort of moved and thought a lot about it afterwards about again it's it's sort of a, a film about sort of when you sort of maybe leave a part of yourself and then you kind of you know, that part of yourself gets left behind when you go and embrace another part of yourself and how that part of yourself is brought about is to do with the context, but it is all still deep in you. Um, so I really loved that film. Um, and the last film I think I properly cried at was actually Coda, um, the the um, the film about the um, the deaf family or the one, the daughter who's who um, who does whose hearing isn't um, who still has her hearing, and that that scene at the end, which I won't give it away if anyone has, but it's about her kind of doing her performance to to get into music college. Um, and that that had me totally, and I thought that was a very beautiful film. So yeah, Coda. I think what well, yeah, it's. Um, I remember it was it won Best Picture at the Oscars. Um, it won, it won Best Picture. Yeah, it won Best Picture at the Oscars, and it was a really beautiful film. Yeah, film about family and this young girl who um, is uh, with all her, her her parents and her sibling are are deaf, uh, and and she's not, and so she, kind of she plays a very important role within the dynamic of their family and yet feels kind of torn when she suddenly discovers this talent within herself and wants to go and pursue it at music college, but worries about that will, what that will do to her family and, and their needs for her. And again, it's a sort of film about kind of, I guess, mutual understanding of a kind of crossroads in life in the same way with past lives, uh, that it's really touching in the way they kind of do the last couple sequences um, where they unite all the things they've explored. It's just, it's just gorgeous. And, um, I remember when you sent the answers uh, through to me earlier, uh, you did mention uh, a scene, and I only mentioned this because I watched it. Uh, tell me a scene that really made you cry as a child. I believe it's a Steven Spielberg scene. Um, it was E.T. E.T. Um, when, again, spoiler alert for anyone who's not seen it, but there is a kind of, you know, an assumed near death. I was absolutely gone every time like properly wailing and it always hit me i always found it so tragic and then the moment with which you know i won't say too much more but the scene progresses from there is it's like destroys me um every time it's i just so i watched it this morning because i was like i'm gonna remind myself of uh of this scene and it's the bit where elliot is reaching over to him and et's dying yeah. and he's like E.T., please stay with me. I'm like, yeah. oh, I can't do this. I haven't slept have enough. You, have you seen that young actor's audition as well? Henry Thomas, right. 
Yeah, he's like the, the the audition for the film is on YouTube as well, and he's doing it's from the bit just before when he's sort of saying you're scaring him, you're scaring him, and you see him and he's just pouring out, and you just I I guess it's Steven Spielberg. You just hear this voice in the background and go, "You got the job, kid." <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but it is this extraordinary, like exquisite audition. Um, yeah, it's really worth a watch. Just look you look up, you know, Henry Thomas some you know ET audition, um, but it's it's quite something. Uh, yeah, be careful with the ET one though. I should have read the the tagline. It's oh, it's on YouTube under the saddest scene in cinema history, and I was like, I'll be the judge of that. Uh, it broke yeah. me, broke me this morning. <laughs> okay, our final poster then, George, of this that. Pick your unpopular movie opinion. I was I'm, I was trying to think about this when when I was the question. I I'm really struggling with this because I feel like pretty. Other, maybe other than sort of Mamma Mia, given the you know the sales of the DVD, um, maybe that will be it because because I, I feel pretty diplomatic with films. Like I really enjoy and appreciate of all that kind film. of you know efforts, whether I kind of whether they chime personally or 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 not. So I haven't really I don't have one that I'm like everyone needs to see this film because also I think the ones that are, that I like as well most you know at, at least kind of not friends they're with the, they're the classics you know so everyone's kind of a bit like yeah you know. And I'm not no, never sort of railed against, um, oh, you know, that's you know, that's sacrilege that, that you know that film's nowhere near as good as it's thought, or that film's sort of way better than it's given credit for. So I'm sorry to sort of give a non-answer, but I genuinely I was thinking about this, and I can't think of like a time where it's been like, what you think that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. So I don't know if you can help me as a, a prior example or a nudge. Well, um, I mean. And it, it, it's interesting. I mean, you don't have like a guilty pleasure. You don't have a movie that everyone else has like gone like this is rubbish. That you're like, how how do people think this is rubbish? For example, someone the other day picked um the uh, supersonic flop battleship based on the board game of the same name, which was widely right. panned and one of the biggest flops. And they were like, people are wrong. That is a cinematic masterpiece of blockbuster summer filmmaking. Of that. Yes, um... Okay, let me have a quick wrap. I mean, there's sort of ones that I feel like maybe slightly unex unexpected. I remember loving the, sure. like a surf film, Blue Crush. You know, remember that for that film, Blue Crush? I do. I remember just really enjoying that film and watching that a bunch of times as well. And and I think because it maybe it's not a film that's sort of spoken about as much now, um, mm. that would be sort of... But it feels, again, sort of disingenuous as if it was a failure because it's not because in my <laughs> eyes, I'm like, I thought it was great. And... I just remember the scenes. I was really haunted by this. The, the lead character, she has these sort of nightmares of wiping out a pipeline and banging her head on the reef underwater. I've got a real thing about like the sound in those nightmares was so bad. There was a kind of wet kind of as she banged her head on the reef. Um, and it always really kind of jarred me and stuck with me and, and really affected me. So um, yeah, maybe, maybe that, but it feels like um, a slightly you know i don't know i'm a slightly kind of diluted answer i'm gonna take it i think i think okay. like, crushes is not a movie i think as many people have seen as you think have seen it so i think your right. popular movie com opinion can be that more people should have seen blue crush and i'll put the post of blue crush okay perfect and if there's any discrepancies we have a couple of sort of merged posters so we there, you know there's room to go around i guess yeah as well. we, can, we can pull one of the early ones down make it about dis destroy jungle later although obviously copyright <laughs> me uh, right then george we have reached the final set of doors these right. lead into the auditorium now there is as often in the cinema there is a queue of people hoping to join yourself leonardo DiCaprio, and your partner in the auditorium do you want to let them in? You don't have to. You're not obliged. You can have it just the three of you, or do you want a busy cinema? What you feel? Oh, I know that totally. Yeah, like get get in. I think we need to get people into the cinema. So please get them in and tell them that there's films. That, you know, there's going to be 20 minutes of adverts. So text their mates before they turn their phones off, um, and then uh, you know get them down. We want a full. We want a full house. Right then, the crowd are pouring in. They go wild. They take their seats. You are in the middle of the middle. It's time to play a few things on the big screen before we get to the movie you picked for us tonight. The first thing we are going to play is a trailer for the movie you are most looking forward to seeing at the cinema. Um, I, um, I'm i most looking forward to because I haven't seen it yet. Is Anatomy of a Fool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, really good. Yeah, really yeah, good. That, that reaction makes me want to see it even more. I'm really excited to see 
that film um and i'm hopefully going to see it you know very very soon um but but anatomy of a fool is what i'd like to see and um, weirdly uh this is going to be a repeat if anyone listened to the last episode and um, we were talking about it on the literally the last episode of this at uh, the dog don't know how you how much you're into animal performances the dog in anatomy of a fool uh it's a it's a border collie it's real name in real life is messy it gives one of the wow. most phenomenal animal performances you've ever seen in a film. Do you, really? do you, do you follow animal performances? As a weird I was going to say, like, I'm imagining it sort of getting kind of acting lessons from like the Bacardi cat or something. Right? <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> like, I actually, I actually did, did a, 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 like my very first job was when I was a wee boy was this film Peter Pan and they had the St. Bernard who played Nana, the, you know, the, 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 the dog in it. Um, and, and the guy who had the St. Bernard I think also trained the Bacardi cat. You know, remember that advert where the cat sort of jumping and, you know, dancing. Um, and he was like, yeah, that, that was me. So, yeah. And maybe they, they now have an acting school, like, you know, the sort of, you know, like the equivalent of the actor studio, but for but for, but for dogs and cats. I, do you know what? It, it would not surprise me because Messi, and I only found out about this award, Messi from Anatomy of a Fall. There's loads of other good stuff in it, by the way. I'm just focusing on the dog at the moment. It's a great wow. film outside the dog. This dog uh, won the Palm Dog at the Cannes Film Festival this year, which is an actual award. The, is that actually a Palm Dog? No, there's not a Palm Dog. It really is. I wouldn't lie to you, George. It's a Palm wow. Dog. Cannes is in, as in Cannes dog food. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a big deal. This dog. Right. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Well, well, I, I look forward to seeing the Border Collies performance. My, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're smart dogs, so I have, I have no doubt it will be good. And it, it's it's good. Also, the rest of the film is fantastic. We're going to play the trailer for Anatomy of a Fall. Did you did you get on with the St. Bernard on the set of Peter Pan? I wasn't actually that kind of. I only had one scene with 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 the St. Bernard, and she, she was great. She was fun, fantastic. But it was um my character only sort of came into her domain for a, for a wee, very brief scene at the end. So we only had a day together. Um, but I remember she was. Huge and gorgeous and very well, very incredibly well behaved. Good, 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 good. Big fan of some Bernards. Right then, next thing we're going to play on the big screen after the trailer for Anatomy of a Fall is the movie moment makes you literally or metaphorically pump your fist in the air. Um, I um, what, what I mentioned um the um the John Leguizamo gun gunfight at the beginning of Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet, and I always remember that kind of matador pose with the two the two guns and it's so flamboyant and that that first fight i remember doing like romeo and juliet at school and it's you know a text that you do sort of a, a, a few times in english and then in drama and then seeing that version of it and all the kind of it's just so fantastically flamboyant the whole thing um and then when he drops to his knees and he's got the kind of virgin mary on his kind of vest i was like it's so over the top <laughs> But it's so perfect. Um, I'd say that kind of like fist bump, like not, not fist bump, the sort of two hands kind of, uh, you know, matador stance into a sort of drop and roll <laughs> with a cigarette and steel high heels um, is probably my fist bump moment. Um, or, you know, and failing that, um, the, the, the epic sort of kilt lift and speech of Braveheart. Oh yes, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Both, yeah. both good moments. Both strong of that. I feel so, you that gonna, I, no. I feel you're leaning more towards John Leguizamo's performance as Tybalt in um, Romeo and Juliet, though. I think, I think, yeah, because I think actually maybe those big battle sequences is a sort of, uh, but there is that kind of like mini like when I think of a fist bump, I think of it is more being a sort of fist pump. Sorry, being a more kind of reactive. Like, whoa, that was cool. Like, and I remember yeah. as a wee boy being like, whoa, didn't see that move coming. Um, and it's, yeah, just sort of, it was so kind of balletic as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, so I'm going to go with Tibbles. Oh, great choice. Great scene. I mean, Baz Luhrmann, like, I want Yeah, the, 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 with the petrol can dinging, you know, and the lady being hit, it was being hit over the head and he's there going, yeah, <laughs> da, 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 da. Like, it's just so much. And just the high speed kind of like the edits of, it's so kind of, frenetic and brilliant yeah it's amazing it's amazing i mean i'm not gonna lie i sort of went oh wow shakespeare's now cool uh, yeah yeah <laughs> which, yeah 
yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, like the Philistine I am. I'm like, cool. Oh, someone finally made the Shakespeare guy. Cool. Uh, lovely. <laughs> but, we'll play that awesome petrol station sequence from Romeo and Juliet uh, with Tybalt doing his stuff. Right. The next thing we're going to play is what you consider cinema's most shocking moment. Now, I was wary of this because this pertains to a film that I'd love to show later on, and it's a big old spoiler alert. Um, okay. So I don't really know how to talk about it. And um, But one of my favourite films is No Country for Old Men, and Llewellyn, the character of Llewellyn, who's played by Josh Brolin, um, the, way things, the way things come about with his character, you've been so with him for so much of the film. Um, when a certain shift in the plot occurs um i just thought it was so brilliantly told kind of offhand the way that 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 particular turn in the story is given that i so did i was kind of for a while afterwards like did hold on did that just that's not gonna okay, okay wow that's that's happened that's actually okay that's it that's that bit okay that's happened wow okay um so i would say in a sense it's not like a jump scare but it it totally floored me when that that the, that sort of plot point, which I'm not going to name for for anyone who's not seen it, um, happens given the way that it's given the way that it's told and, and given to you as an audience. So um, I'm going to put that as my most unsuspecting moment or shock. I am going to put a big old spoiler warning in the show just so we can talk about it ever so slightly more because I think you've picked genuinely one of cinema's most shocking moments. So this is Llewellyn's death. There's been a spoiler warning. People know. If they, if they're not seen 2007 stuff and from Med, we're going into spoiler territory and um, it's weird isn't it because it just breaks because it's the cohen brothers it just breaks yeah. the the structure that we're all ingrained it's all it's ingrained in all of us about what we expect to happen in a movie yeah it's and it's the thing is you're, you're so with him and there's so much silence in that film you're with these kind of people on their own all the time and you've been so with him and he's such a capable character. He feels indestructible. And then you suddenly with Tommy Lee Jones, who's driving, you know, the cop who's kind of piecing together this this case. And he's just driving quietly. And you hear just in the distance, off screen, he's kind of bang, 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 bang. And this car, and it's shot in a wide. So you're sort of from his POV. This car just like ricochet onto the onto the onto the road ahead and just drive off. And you never, you never see it. You don't know who. Well, and you're like, well, in the same way in Tommy Lee Jones's character, you kind of go, God, what happened there? Mm-hmm. And then you pull in and you realize that that was, that was the, you know, you, you, then there's a shot that night where you realize that the, the, the murder that just took place was, was Llewellyn. And you just see him on, on the floor for a second. And you're like, hold on, is that, he's not coming back. And then, then he's never referenced again. And you know, there's no music, there's no sort of slow zoom. You just and it's so kind of true, I guess, in the way that of that death can just snuff people out, you know, and and especially a death like that is it just happens and it's irreversible and it happened really quickly and there wasn't that build up, it wasn't a big fight sequence. You weren't even there for when it happened. You just you just came across him later on and you can't believe that the person you've been following the entire movie you just come across in a wee bit, you know. So um, forgive the spoiler alert, but that I thought the telling of that was so brilliant and and it really floored me when it happened and a bit like well a lot like femme because i think in your film femme so much is said from looks between uh, your characters and there's a moment at the end of the scene you're talking about in a country for old men where kelly mcdonald's character comes up and tommy lee jones doesn't say you know he's dead or anything like that he literally just looks at her and takes his hat off and she breaks yeah. down and yeah. it's it, it it like with Femme, it's a, it's a, it's a case of being able to show things without needing to handhold the audience with dialogue. Yeah, 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 yeah. It reminds me similarly of I think it's Saving Private Ryan when you when you go to the sort of you've never met them before, but the mother of what would be the Ryan brothers, if I believe. Um, and you just sort of it pans outside this woman as this as this army car pulls up, and two guys get out, and you and she just drops slowly to the floor, and the camera kind of booms down with her. And you just know that she's got this, you know what she knows. And it's, you know, and you really feel that, you know, that the world's been pulled out from underneath her. Lovely moment. That is cinema's most shocking moment for you. Uh, only only a couple of moments away from the movie you're going to be playing for us tonight. So 
Next up, what is the line or piece of dialogue from a movie, George, that's most affected you? I say this is from Shane Meadows' This Is England, the uh, the original film. Um, and it's a scene where Sean, who's played by Tom Turgus, is kind of getting his head shaved had to sort of initiate himself as a skinhead, basically. And with the character of Woody, who's played by Joe Gilgan, just goes, honestly, mate, you look sterling. And that, that the way he says it is just so brilliant. And the the use of the adjective sterling, it's just great. And he goes, honestly, mate, you look sterling. I'm really <laughs> proud of you, Sean. And it's just so kind of heartfelt and of that strong and simple. I, I always love that line. I always love that line and how he delivers it and that scene. That 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 film really affected me when I when I was growing up and I watched that film so often. Um, all the performances in it, you know, I'd, I'd never seen a film that was sort of that kind of real. I, I kind of know now a wee bit the way that Shane works and the sort of amount of improvisation, but the um, you know, Stephen Graham's performance in that. And now Stephen Graham's kind of like one of our household names so to speak mm. but yeah i remember there's the electricity of when combo comes into the room of in that a, in another a... scene and you just know like oh i like this guy but i know he's trouble and i yeah, i'm really sort of nervous and he he just had that thing that his performance he had that thing of like um, he, he makes me nervous and it's sort of like as a sort of person it's kind of weirdly attractive and terrifying because you know that oh I, he's very beguiling but he's also I'm, I'm wary of this guy and it, and it makes him magnetic to watch. Um, but to go back to the line, I've just always loved, honestly, mate, you look sterling. I think he's just brilliant. This... Right then, it's booming out through the Dolby Atmos speakers. Honestly, mate, you look sterling. Uh, you, you, <laughs> did, you did it far better. Right, the final <laughs> thing we're going to play through the same speakers before we get to your movie is the best use of music in a movie. The best use of, well, I've got a dual answer that well, I, well, I'll give you sort of, we answer first is my initial thought is one of the most affected I've ever been in the cinema was when I saw Snowtown by Justin Cazell mm. um, about the Snowtown murders in South Australia. And Justin works with his brother, Jed, um, it, who Jed does the music for his films. And there's this kind of like thrumming, thrumming is the only way I can think of to sort of describe it this kind of tone that goes and the film begins with this quite, um, I can't think of that, maybe sort of quite bizarre, but very low key voiceover, a sort of story of a dream. But under, and this, and this, you just watch the road going by, fields going by. And underneath is this kind of <laughs> kind of like feeling. And I, I remember that film when it finished kind of dropping back about a foot into my chair and and woke and I, the next morning it's the only time genuinely I woke up sad the next day like I woke up sort of holding myself. I found that movie so affecting and and I think so much of it is that music is that this because they also do this really amazing thing where Justin uses kind of like a uh, I think it's almost like stop motion. So you see these port those bits in it where the characters are after they've committed a certain act in it and you're watching these kind of them be there but they're just sort of it's just still pictures but they're just moving slightly. And you realise actually that it's sped up over about, it's like a 20 minute shot of them just sat, not moving, because you're going to get a cigarette for a second of, and it goes, and it's sort of, it's that nightmarish thing of being like, oh God, those guys have not moved for 20 minutes, but you're sort of watching it in real time, but they're juddering all those little movements. And that was supported so much by this kind of thrumming, throbbing music score, which is sort of under your skin the whole time. And there's not like big, you know, musical sequences. But that I found so affecting, I wanted to mention that. And then, but then on top of that, as a sort of dual mention, is to go back to This Is England. I remember I've always loved since that film, the use of Ludovico and Unidi, the, um, the pianist, and and the choice of music for for that. When, and just kind of offsetting a kind of toughness, um, the offsetting the visuals with a different type of mu music. There's, there's a couple of sort of montage sequences in that film at first kind of quite happy some of them um where you see the skinhead, skinhead gang together and they've got a real sort of identity as a gang and they all look amazing and there's a real sort of like i don't know counterculture energy to them but it's this stunning single you know single person classical piano going underneath it and then later on there's a terrible terrible attack in the film which is then supported by 
another piece of the same musicians that's just one guy on the piano and it's so beautiful but what you're looking at as that beautiful music is happening is so beautiful um just the offsetting of those two things i found so affecting so um of that i thing. guess no, I don't know. What do you reckon it's best you to can... kind of go from honestly make you look sterling into Enyunadi or to because <laughs> we've had one this is England to go with Snowtown? I, I honestly, because of your description of both, I, I'd be hard pressed to 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 pick one. So I'm gonna let you listen to both of those okay. as we build the climax of our night. George, it's time to declare to Leonardo DiCaprio, your partner, this packed auditorium. The movie out of all others you have picked for us to watch tonight. George, what are we watching? We're watching No Country for Old Men by the Coen Brothers. Because it is exquisite. And it's one of my favourite films. It's one of the most affected I've been in the cinema. I Similarly, when I watched it, I watched it in Whiteley's, I believe, in Queensway. Yeah, uh, the no, Odeon no. that used to be there. And I remember dropping back into my seat when the when it cut to black and the credits began and sort of exhaling and I didn't realise I'd been holding my breath and everyone's performance, Javier Bardem, again, that same thing of like enormous performances, like so subtle, so nuanced, but enormous and bizarre and beautiful. Um and it's also one of those some of those films which I've loved, I've showed to friends in the past, and you kind of realise, oh, that was particular to the time when I loved it. And I've shown no country to, of uh, no country for old men to 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 friends not that long ago who hadn't seen it and i was like so proud because i was like it's still so good and they were like that was amazing i was like yes i know um it's just masterful so i would love to of that full film. house and watch that again at the cinema and um, when you're showing it to friends, do you do that thing, which i do i don't know whether it's me or whether it's a, a thing when you're showing a movie that you love to people you watch them watching the movie. You've seen the movie. You're looking at their yeah. reactions. Yeah, there was a bit of that. But then I was so conscious. You know, there's the bit, you know, when he's he's going to check the crime scene and the headlights come up on the cliff and you think, oh, shit. And that, and I, but I was like, I wanted them to have the oh, shit moment. And so I didn't want to look at them to be a bit like, because you think, because then they know that something's going to happen. So I was doing everything to just keep watching the screen neutrally. Um, you know, so... Because you kind of the headlights go off and you're there with him, and suddenly it goes <clears throat> when you're like, oh no, 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 no. So um, yeah, I I, I was trying to focus, but I was watching them as well. So why these uh, Odeon uh, on Queensway? Was this a solo cinema trip, or what did you see in company? It was actually with my mum. It was with my really? mum. He's actually always been a, a great sort of cinematic guide. So it was um, yeah, it was my mum and I, you know, after school one day. That's great. So, who's whose choice was it? Was it your mum taking you? Oh, Did your mum? Yeah, your mum. I think I kind of wasn't even fully aware of like the Cohen Brothers. I didn't know like, oh, we're going to see a Cohen Brothers film at that time, or like you know Roger Deakins or Josh Brolin. I think she would have known about their kind of track record more than I at that point. I was just kind of like going as a punter, and then was just so absorbed by the whole thing because um, it's just it just holds you, it just holds you the whole time. That's amazing. Well, well done to your mum for taking you to see uh, yeah. No Country for All Men and giving you that experience. Did you have a coffee afterwards and dissect the movie? Oh, no, no. I was I didn't drink coffee. I think I probably had a very sweet cup of tea. <laughs> uh, yeah, get the energy back. It is one of those yeah, movies yeah. you feel you feel literally drained afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, totally. And then to going home sort of like of that. Know, what Tommy Lee Jones says at the end of the film, I still don't fully understand, but I've watched that monologue back a few times trying to work out that dream. Um, yeah. of that film. and then it's I mean I don't want to oh, I can say the last line but I don't want to say the last line all right um, all right okay well we'll let people experience that in case they haven't experienced it yeah. uh yeah. have uh, missed out the spoiler earlier <laughs> then no yeah, they yeah, I, hope, I, you know, I hope I haven't messed it up for people now no, but, no, no. You know. no 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 we'll give fair warning hey George wow cop what a journey that's it the curtains are closing the guests, Leonardo DiCaprio, your partner, everyone, they're smiling, milling out, thanking you for taking them for an incredible night at the cinema. But before you go, morning oh, yeah. at the cinema, it's time for this week's mystery question as we ask, what's in the box? Tell us an exclusive 
never before heard bits of information about your career, past, present, or future? I feel like, I feel sort of like maybe there's all the stuff that sort of would be kind of, so <laughs> maybe, uh, the weightiest stuff I've not said for, for the very reason of not saying it, but I guess if it was sort of like, there's been a couple of lovely, um, through lines where, you know, sometimes when something's kind of, I, I, I love the idea that certain things are kind of meant, meant to be. Um, and there, I did a, a film when I was 15 called defiance, um, and Daniel Craig played the lead character in that. And it was the story of the Bielski brothers who formed a partisan group during the second world war to protect, uh, Jews in the forest in Belarusia. Um, and he played the character of Tuvia Belsky and he had his sort of hero leather costume jacket. And I remember then doing a film, uh, another world war two film, um, called where hands touch, uh, years later, like I think nine years later. Um, and there was a scene with Christopher Eccleston, um, who was playing my father and myself. Um, and I was playing a German character that time. And they, and they were, there was this scene where they were sort of discussing, you know, having a father son talk about everything and the kind of the commitment to, um, to the, to the war effort. And they gave me this fantastic leather jacket to wear. And I said, oh, you know, I, I like this jacket. Like, where's it from? It feels kind of very right sort of for the character. And they said, well, I'll tell you what, it's actually been in a World War II film. That was Daniel Craig's jacket in the film Defiance. And I said, no way, I played his baby brother. <laughs> and they said, yeah, well, this is like the double of that jacket. And it's kind of, you know, it's the non-broken down one because that character was living in the woods and it had work done to it to make it different. But this is the sort of, double prototype um and i was like how funny is that like sort of nine years later to be wearing your big brother's jacket in an entirely different world war ii film um so so there there we go there's there's a wee sort of something that it felt, it felt kind of right it felt sort of fortuitous to be a bit like oh you know right place right time and all of that um so to be in that jacket i had to literally That's... fit it then as well <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Oh, wow. What a story. Thank you for that, George. What a way to end. Because now, do you know what? Your taxi's arrived to ferry <laughs> you and your guests back to reality. But before you go, it is time to recap your perfect trip to the movies. You are going with your partner and Leonardo DiCaprio at 10 32 in the morning you're sitting in the middle of a row in the middle of the cinema you are not having your favorite solo snack of dark chocolate with a nice cup of coffee you're having salted popcorn apple straws and a fizzy drinks for you a bottle of water we're leaving the foyer and heading down the corridor putting up a poster for your fondest movie memory which is a mashup in the spirit of Oppenheimer, uh, Oppenheimer, Barbenheimer, of the Jungle Book and Gladiator. We've gone for Jungle Nator. We are then putting up your worst movie memory, which, and you stay till the end, and you feel bad for saying it, but your worst movie memory was 2008 musical romantic comedy, A Mamma Mia. Here we go again. Uh, well, no, that's the sequel. I shouldn't have added Here We Go Again. I can't help but say <laughs> Mamma Mia without saying Here We Go Again. The third poster we're putting up depicts the last performance that brought you to tears. And that was in the best picture Oscar winner, Coda, the climax to that movie. The little special mention for E.T.'s death from when you were a child. And the final poster depicts your unpopular movie opinion. We're going to have a think about this. We're going to look around. We're going to have a decision as to where the blue cross should be in there. We're going to do that later. I might come back after you've left and take it down if it doesn't work. But right now, you are putting up a picture, a, blue, a poster for Blue Crush as a movie that not enough people have seen. Right, we enter the auditorium. We are playing the trailer for Anatomy of a Fall. We are then playing the movie moment that makes you literally or metaphorically pump your fist in the air, which is the moment from Romeo and Juliet when Tybalt does his stuff at the petrol station. Cinema's most shocking moment is, spoiler alert, Llewellyn's death in No Country for Old Men. The line of dialogue from a movie that most affected you. Honestly, mate, you look sterling. This is England, and the music we are playing is the score from Snowtown and Ludovico Nurd's score from This Is England, the pianist. And here we are. The movie we are screening tonight, George, you have picked No Country for Old Men, and that is 
it. Thank you for oh. taking us on a trip to the movies. Have you had a good time? Thank you. I've had a great time. That's That sounds like a wonderful trip. Place. <laughs> All my favourite things. Thank you very, very much. That's really lovely. Really it's lovely. been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure joining you on this trip. Thank you for taking us. And it is. It's a wonderful, wonderful curated trip to the movies. Have a lovely evening, George. Yeah, and you, Alex. Thank you so, so much for having me. And uh, yeah, all the very best, man. And uh, once again, I'll say for the last time, as you depart, as you're getting in your taxi and waving off, going, by the way, Fem is brilliant, out on December the 1st. It really is. I hope everyone goes and sees it uh, because it's a, a truly great movie. So congratulations again. Tell Thank us you so, it... so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this interview. Um. I'd love it if you would check out some of the other interviews on our channel. They're all fascinating and unique trips to the movies with some wonderful, wonderful guests. And if you would like to find out more, do hit us up on our social channels. We are at Trip to Movies Pod. That's at Trip to Movies Pod on all social media with lovely content on there. And you can get in touch with us if you so wish. Thanks again.